No matter who you are or where you go, heading outside is always worth it. Welcome to Humans Outside, where we're using the Humans Outside 365 Challenge to build a life around spending time in nature while learning from fascinating outdoor-minded guests. I'm Amy Bouchotte. I've let curiosity be my guide as a journalist for 18 years. But life, including my husband's war injuries, had burnt us out. So we moved sight unseen to Alaska to see if a change of scenery and new focus on outdoors was just the shift we needed. Since September 2017, I've spent at least 20 consecutive minutes outside every single day, no matter what, to explore how nature can change my life. Ready to hear from experts and outdoor lovers who make heading into nature just a part of who they are while we work to do the same? Let's go! Here at Humans Outside, we focus on the practicalities of heading outside every day and give you the tools and help to build that outdoor habit. But of course, to do that, we lean on those who have worked to be experts on the practical steps it takes to make that happen, including people who focus on the basics and tools to get outside. One of those experts is today's guest, Kristen Bohr. At about the same time I first turned on humansoutside.com back in 2014, Kristen was founding her own outdoor-focused website, Barefoot Theory. She had been working in environmental policy in D.C. and left that to refocus on actually connecting with nature, not unlike what my family did when we moved sight unseen to Alaska in 2016. She now spends half the year living in her home in Utah and half the year traveling through the U.S. in her converted Sprinter camping van. Today, her website, Barefoot Theory, is packed with checklists and help for the basics of getting outside and, for those who want to in on that awesome van life, video series, how-tos, and more on converting your own van. And she's joining us here to talk about how adventure life and normal life can meet. Kristen, welcome to Humans Outside. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Man, I am so excited to talk to you. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you for giving us your time and sharing your wisdom. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat with you. So we start all of our episodes imagining ourselves with our guests in their favorite outdoor space, like we are not sitting in our individual podcast spots, but like we are somewhere outside having a chat. Where are we with you today? Oh, boy. Uh, Well, I think probably one of the most memorable uh, outdoor experiences I've had was um, watching the sunrise at the top of Mount Whitney at the end of my John Muir trail hike. So let's Hmm. imagine ourselves there. (laughs) Awesome. And it is always fun to take a break and have a, you know, have like a little chat at the end of a long hike. So I'm here for it. Cool. Hopefully there are snacks. Okay. (laughs) How did you become somebody who likes to go outside? Talk, Talk us through your journey. Sure. Yeah. I didn't grow up doing outdoorsy things. I didn't grow up in an outdoorsy family. And I went to the University of Puget Sound in Washington for college, which is a small school in Tacoma, and had a pretty strong outdoor vibe. Um, I didn't really have an opportunity to do a lot of that kind of thing in college. I was a chemistry major, so I spent a lot of time in the library. (laughs) And uh, at the end of college, I was just really craving, um, you know, more meaningful experience outside. And so that's when I went on my first backpacking trip. And I realized that it was going to be a way for me to get healthier and build confidence and have a lot more fun (laughs) doing that kind of thing versus, you know, city type activities that I was used to doing. So that's how I sort of was first introduced to it. Yeah, we, uh, my family and I lived in Tacoma, Washington for a little bit. So I'm super familiar (laughs) with the area. Yeah, we were, um, my husband was stationed there at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Gotcha. Um, That's cool. Yeah. So love that region. Uh, and I know exactly the vibe you're talking about. It's a very like fleece vest sort of place. Like, yes. <laughs> how many exactly do you own and uh, what is the quality uh, continuum on there? So how did uh, van living and adventuring become a part of your life? How do you get from like, I have this outdoor vibe to I think I'll live in a van part of the year. Yeah. So, uh, In my early 30s, I found myself living in Washington, D.C. After grad school, I got a fellowship that took me there. I was working on the Hill in Congress 
um, on environmental policy. And after three years there, it was never really my plan to end up there. But um, after three years there, I sort of decided that I wanted to move back west. Um, I grew up in Idaho and was just wanted to be closer to the mountains and outdoor activities. And um, that's when I started kind of researching on the internet, different career paths that would allow me to travel and spend more time outside doing what I loved and kind of stumbled on some blog posts that talked about blogging as a career. So I decided to quit my job. Uh, I moved back West and started my website. And that's sort of when I dove in head first into just making the outdoors part of my daily life versus, you know, something that I just did you know, maybe one day a week on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we must have read the same blog posts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was on uh, Nomadic Matt, who's yeah, we, know, famous uh, blogger. Yeah. yeah just uh, inspirational, you know, and, um, but you, you were braver than I on that. And I, cause I did not quit my full-time job. I thought I could do all of this on the side and not have it be my, my primary focus. Um, so I I love that you took the leap and have been so successful doing that. It's really um, inspiring. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So specifically, we are going to talk today about van life and how cool. it can be a part of your outdoor habit when you are leading an otherwise traditional lifestyle. So nine to five job, kids in sports, living in a city or a typical town, suburb, whatevs. Um because that's not what you do, but it is what you help people do. So start by giving us a definition here. When we say van life, what do we mean? Well, I think there's different ways that people define it. But for me, I think it means anyone who lives or travels in a van. It could be part-time, full-time, um, in a city, out in nature. I think everybody has the opportunity to define what van life looks like for them. Um, so for me, uh, we, as you said in the intro, we have a house in Salt Lake. We spend winters here and then we spend, you know, six to eight months a year outside of the snow season, uh, living and traveling in our van. So, um, you know, I think there's like the purists who are like, no, I live in my van. I don't have a house. I'm, you know, full blown mm -hmm. all in. And then there's people who use their vans for the weekend. So I don't think there's really a you know, a definition that you have to abide by to quote unquote do van life. Yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine a lot of these practicalities depend on where you call home, what the temperature is outside. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, jobs, kids, the whole nine yards. So there's like a whole continuum. But um, one of the things we're really focusing on this season on Humans Outside is um, nature accessibility and uh, that outdoors can be wherever you are. Um, even if you are somewhere like a city. And so um, I'm excited to dig into how this is a part of that. Uh, but tell us like why, so we see like, I mean, I personally follow approximately a bajillion van life <laughs> Instagram pages, right? This is like a very picturesque, inspirational thing. People really like the idea. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on where that stems from. Like why is this such an attractive idea to people? Well, I think it's living outside the confines of conventional living. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with the pandemic, the lifestyle has really blown up as people realize that they can work remote, they can work from anywhere, all they need is an internet connection. Um, and the van puts nature at your doorstep. So, mm. you know, for me, it's really appealing because I just know how much I benefit from being outdoors, you know, whether that's going on a hike or just sitting and watching the sunset or reading a book outside, just that fresh air does something for my spirit that I just don't get when I'm home inside my house all the time. And mm. so for me, the appeal has just been you know, the accessibility to the adventure and just the mental and physical benefits of spending so much time outside. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, okay. So we have a van, we call it the Vanimal. It's not a looker. Oh, cool. <laughs> it sits in my yard. 
uh, most of the time, right? Because we are very much weekend van people. Also, it's negative 15 degrees outside my house right now. So Holy not cow. Really, yeah, right. So it's oh not gosh. really the kind of place you want to <laughs> live in a van at the moment. What um, kind of van is it? Okay, so we have a 1997 Ford Coachman. So awesome. it is lumbering. It's an, it's an animal. Thus, it is the vanimal. Although I will, I so I kind of ran a contest. Uh, listeners will remember I asked for their suggestions on van names. Um, and I will tell you, if it had occurred to me to name the van Kevin after the bird in in Up, I would have done that. But it did not. So it is the Vanimal, uh, which conveniently had a license tag available. So here we are. Um, and um, I love camping in it because it's very, very, you know, we're otherwise we're tent campers. Um, it extends our season. And I feel like I am both in protected, but also in nature in a way that I don't feel when I'm in a tent. Like I, in the tent, I feel much more vulnerable. Is that, yeah. am I crazy? Is that a No, I, I think that's super accurate. I mean, whether it's uh, weather or wildlife, um, mm. you know, the van and the four walls definitely provide a sense of security. And the fact that like, you can get up in the driver's seat and drive away in the matter of seconds versus, you know, having to pack down your whole camp and all that. Um, I definitely think it makes you feel safer and mm -hmm. less vulnerable than you might, you know, if you're just camping out in the woods somewhere. But yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, I also want to touch on, uh, um, I, I want to mention that not everybody can afford a van, uh, but, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, we know that while we're talking about this, um, <laughs> yeah, we know that it's, a, you know, it could be a investment. Um, so just everyone, we will cut, we'll come back to that. Uh, but there's a continuum here. It does, they don't have to be all Definitely. the money you've ever had. So, okay. So we'll get to that in a second, but I just want to state that up front. Okay. So the practicalities, um, of life, as we've mentioned, keep most people from just having a nomadic lifestyle. Um, but I also think that people can create the life and ideal they want. Uh, it's just maybe not where they are right this second. Um, so how can having a van be a part of your regular life? How can we make this sort of meet in the middle, like somewhere between I do this all the time and, and, um, I do this not at all. <laughs> right. I think there's a number of ways to make that work. I mean, like you said, you know, people who have kids and a nine to five job, I think having a van or a vehicle that you can sleep in certainly makes getting away on the weekend so much easier because all you got to do is throw your clothes and some food in, in the van and you can take off versus packing and unpacking and, you know, all the prep that goes into a camping trip. Like a lot of that's really minimized when you're traveling in a van. So that's one advantage. And I think, um, you know, families that like to get away every weekend, it's a really convenient way to do so. Mm. Um, I think that, um, you know, people like me who like having the stability of a home base um, certain times of year, but also like to travel, um, you know, you can rent out a room in your house to help mm cover your costs or, um, you know, a lot of people will Airbnb their house during the times that they're not home, um, to make it more financially sustainable. So I think there's like creative ways to sort of allow you to have a home base while still getting out there. Um, you know, and then there's of course the people who, who make it work and have found, you know, remote careers. And I think especially now there's, just so much more flexibility, even for people who do have a nine to five job mm. where employers are realizing that people don't want to work in an office and, you know, the productivity has actually increased for a lot of people working from home and it doesn't really matter where home is, if that's right. a van or, you know, a an actual house, as long as the work's getting done, I think a lot of employers are realizing that, you know, people's happiness also. Yeah contributes to like a happy workplace. <laughs> right. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really fantastic point, right? So what you're saying is think outside the box a little bit. Yes. Um, we think about, and, and I think that what you just said about the pandemic changing our focus on that is really, really true. You know, I've worked from home for 11 years. And so working from home is no big deal to me. Um, and it kind of blew the mind of so many people in my full-time job company who were like, okay, guys, we're going to work from home now. Um, here's how we do it. And um, I had to stop and remember that this isn't everybody's normal lifestyle. It really isn't. Um, but now it is. Ha ha. And so, <laughs> and so we have this fantastic opportunity to say, okay, pandemic, zero star experience, right? But there are some good things that we learned through it, some experiences that we had that we can take and use to reshape how we view our everyday lives. And maybe one of those is that we can insert a little bit of extra adventure into our lives and work full-time or regular jobs in a way that we didn't before. And that maybe we really like having our kids in some sports, but all of the sports that we had wrapped ourselves into and all of these commitments, maybe all of them aren't necessary. Uh, maybe there's a way to have a meet in the middle where we do things outside as a family that we enjoy, or we sign our kids up for things that um, we can do as a group uh, after they learn how, or we all sign up for lessons. That's what we're doing here. We, <laughs> I am a miserable skier, very bad at it, <laughs> um, but it is something to do in the winter time. And so we're all taking Nordic ski lessons this year so that we can all Nordic ski together. And so that I do not perpetually fall into a snowbank, which is the <laughs> inevitability right now. Yeah. I heard um, you guys got a lot of snow already this, this yeah, year. Yeah, we, we have, and it's, uh, it's quite cold, uh, right now. So that's, uh, that's sort of a detractor, but <laughs> we'll, we'll move past it. It won't last forever. I'm confident, uh, you know, and then um, you also noted the convenience of the van, um, which is something that I've really learned to appreciate. Now, some people have RVs. They already know about this, uh, but not me. Never had really had one. And so I was used to like putting stuff in bins and then taking things out of bins and then, you know, repacking them in the car. Well, guess what? If it's all in the van, um, it's, you know, ready to go. And then you drive yeah. away. And that is beautiful. I have enjoyed yeah. that very, very much. Yeah. I think especially with like your cooking stuff, mm -hmm. that's, you know, just like the spatulas and the spoons and the pots and the pans and yes. the knives, just like having that all in there versus having to like carry it in and out of your kitchen every week um, is like definitely one of the, the big perks for packing convenience. Yeah. Although now that we're talking about it, it has occurred to me while we're having this discussion that I have in my van some cooking things that maybe shouldn't be frozen solid, but now are. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm feeling a little bit afraid to go in there and see what's happened to that oil in that can. So, <laughs> But, you know, we'll, we'll update you guys on uh, if it exploded or not. I'm, I don't know if there's soda in the fridge. <laughs> not yeah, anymore. <laughs> Anyway, I guess I, I know what I'm doing when we hang up. Okay. Hey, humans. Did you know you can officially join the Humans Outside 365 Challenge and score some really cool and exclusive challenge swag, including a finisher medal and a decal on humansoutside.com forward slash challenge? You'll also get an outdoor challenge guide written by me for you, an exclusive challenge tracker, and insider info all year long. You don't want to be left out of this. There is never a wrong time to join the Humans Outside 365 Challenge. So get going. Join it today. Go to humansoutside.com forward slash challenge to learn more now. Now, back to the show. Speaking of RVs, how is van life different than a camper or RV? Um, or, or is it, you know, we kind of categorize them different ways. So is it different? Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely different. And, um, you know, there's trade-offs. So I think the difference between a van and RV is like uh, living comfort and space versus mm. um ability to get further off the grid and mm -hmm. flexibility. So mm -hmm. a van is going to be less living space, more time outside versus in the van. Um, 
and not as many amenities. So, you know, maybe you're not going to have a shower and a toilet in your van. You know, maybe your van is going to have a really simple setup, but because of its size, you're able to get further away from the crowds, further off the grid. You can go down that dirt road, not necessarily knowing where it's going to end up. Where if you have a bigger RV, obviously your living space is going to be a lot more plush and comfortable and spacious. You know, you might be able to do yoga inside your RV where you certainly probably won't be able to do yoga inside a van. Um, you might have a shower and a toilet and like a full blown kitchen inside your RV. But when it comes to being able to explore and go find campsites that are further away from the crowds, you're going to be more limited. So, um, I think it's just a matter of choosing kind of what your priorities are and, you know, finding something that matches that. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's um, that accessibility piece in, it, in particular, uh, accessibility of spaces to go is something that we've really appreciated about having about having our van um, that we can just pull off on the side of whatever. Um, and I know that's, that's sort of like an out West thing. That's a Alaska thing that if you're in the Northeast, maybe you don't just park in the middle of wherever all the time. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. But, it's definitely different out in, on the East coast. We were out there last year and yeah, spent a lot more money on paid campgrounds. I mean, there's some yeah. free public lands, but it's definitely not as vast as it is out West. So yeah. it's kind of a different experience. Yeah. Here, I mean, if people, most people probably have not been here to Alaska, but uh, we have a lot of Bureau of Land Management, um, uh, BLM lands, um, and we have a lot of state lands where you're allowed to ca camp however you please. And uh, that means for, you know, for a lot, if you don't mind a little road noise, you literally pull off the side of the highway and camp right there. Um and so that can be very scenic, but also a little loud, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it makes it so that I, you know, we can get in our van and drive wherever we want. And when we're done driving, that's where we, that's where we camp. Um, yeah. and that's a, that's a pretty, pretty fantastic, uh, fantastic thing. No worries about hookups or pulling in or having enough space. It's, you know, it's, it's nice if it's level. Let's put it that way. But yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> but other than that, like the considerations are, are minor. Um, okay. So we just, we talked earlier about the cost of owning a van. So I want to come back to that. Uh, vans can be, I mean, however much you're thinking guys about how much a van might cost, add some. I have seen people driving these rigs through Alaska and, you know, it's got the name brand on it and I'll pull it up and holy cats, bananas. We're talking <laughs> the price of my house or more for some of these, you know, adventure rig would be a um, not too generous of a term, just really mm -hmm. incredible vehicles that are so, so expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. That's the extreme. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then there's the Vanimal, uh, which is probably, which is on the lower end. Um, you know, it's a 1997. It's uh, not worth a lot of money. Um, it wasn't, uh, the guy sold it for way less than he could have. He just based it on a blue book. And guess what the blue book on a Ford, 1997 Ford is? It's like five grand. So, um, that I would say that's probably the lower end. Uh, what's, uh, what's normal? What's the advice for keeping the investment low? Uh, yeah. So the range is huge. Um, I think on the high end, it's four by four sprinter converted by a professional company who's been in business for a long time and a van that's, you know, completely self-contained, you know, off grid, capable, never have to plug in, can go forever with, you know, with limited amenities uh, needed from the outside world. Um, on the lower end of the price scale, um, you know, something that's a little bit older, something that's going to be self converted or bought, you know, already converted by somebody else. Um, but yeah, there's a number of ways to keep your costs down. So, um, one of the girls on my team at Barefoot Theory, she has a van 
Um, it's a Ford Econoline. I think it's like a 1998. It has 250,000 miles on it. And she bought it for super cheap. She did the conversion herself. And she's been on the road for the last year with very few problems and mm -hmm. just loving life and the flexibility and the the financial freedom it's afforded, right? If you spend $200,000 on a van and you can't really afford that, then van life's not going to be very free feeling, right. you know, then you're going to have the burden of the payments or, you know, feeling like you went into debt to live this lifestyle. And that's not really the point. So I think, you know, finding a, a van and like being realistic about your budget and realizing that it's not about the van, it's about the adventures that the van affords. Oh, so good point. Um, yes. You know, I think it's really about kind of just the mindset and yeah, realizing that like you're getting this van because you want to hike and you want to camp in cool places and you want to meet cool people and just do things different um, mm -hmm. versus like, I need the best van because really you're not, you don't spend that much time in the van. You drive the van, you sleep in the van and otherwise you're outside. So right. just kind of adopting that mindset that it's not necessarily about the vehicle. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a really good, that's a really good point because as you mentioned with RVs, you, they're a lot bigger. And so you really, they really can be a house on wheels, right? Like you're spending right. time in the RV, but when you're in the van, it's too small for this, too small. So, yeah. and when you have more than one person in the van, holy cats, right? Yeah. Now it's really <laughs> small. I mean, we get four people in the dogs in my van. We are getting out of the van now. Thank you. Have a yeah. nice day. Um, <laughs> now, and then of course, on the flip side, when it's just me in the van, I'm like, oh, the space. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So you are outside a lot. You are doing whatever you can be doing to not be in the van because it is such a small space. And so, um, it's nice if the bed is comfortable, right? And it's wonderful right. if everything has a home inside the van so yeah. that one, it doesn't fall in your head while you're driving. And two, it's yeah. not mass chaos when you're not. But other than yeah. that, like it's a means of transportation and a bedroom. Yes. Yeah, I think that's spot on. So yeah, yeah I think like for uh, the transits and the ProMasters are going to be cheaper than um, the Sprinter. Those are sort of like the three like modern uh, vans that are very popular, um, pro masters made by Dodge. Um, and then, yeah, getting something that's, you know, if you're willing to build it out yourself and you're willing to source materials that are maybe used or, um, you know, just less expensive, like you can save a lot of money that way. Um, you know, when it comes to building out yourself versus hiring somebody, you really have to kind of Ask yourself, are you are you going to enjoy this process? And um, you know, be honest about your skill set. I mean, people learn how to build vans from scratch just watching YouTube. So if you have the patience and the time, um, I think that that's you know a great route. And I I didn't build my van myself, so I can't speak to it. But I imagine it's a very rewarding process when you're mm -hmm. all done and you're on the road with something that you built with your own two hands. Um, that has to be a pretty great feeling. Yeah. And we did something just like our personal experience. We did something in between where we, I mean, our van was a converted, like a camper van to start with, right? That's mm -hmm. what it was designed for. Uh, but it needed some help and it needed some updating. The windows were leaking. The um, siding inside was rotten. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just like the, oh gosh, the curtains, not good when you have leaky windows <laughs> and yeah. uh, then it sits for a long time. Mm -mm, no. A little moldy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just, and it's, so it smelled weird, all these things, right? Um, you mentioned earlier how your van probably doesn't have a toilet. Ours had a toilet that we took out because I was like, this is a very small space and that <laughs> is in it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we we totally uh, we removed that and made that into a storage area um, because I, you know, could I could imagine having that be a convenience. And there have been mm -hmm. times I'm like, well, if we had a toilet in here, that problem would be solved. Um, but on the flip side, I was like, do I really want to have a toilet in here and have that be the solution to this problem? Because that's going to be a lot of people in here with one person on a toilet, and no, no thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean that that whole issue, toilet versus not having a toilet, is also a, a trade off. And yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the pandemics made me kind of rethink <laughs> the yeah. toilet issue a little bit. Um, yeah. We have um, like a foldable toilet. It's called the mm. Go Anywhere toilet and it yeah. uses wa- it uses wag bags. Um, okay. You know, before the pandemic, it was fine because it was like a once in a while thing. But yeah, once the pandemic happened, we were using it a lot more. The bags are expensive. It's not very mm. eco-friendly. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's been okay, but we're considering other options at this point um, just to make it so we're not so reliant on public facilities that we don't really want to use as much now. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good, such a good point. So lots of considerations there, but when you, when you stop to have these considerations, like you stop to think about this stuff, right now, Mm -hmm. whatever you are driving and whatever you have decided to use is your own, you know, like you've uh, made a personal investment in that. The other thing I want to mention is people, if you're shopping for a van, you at some point have run across a Volkswagen. And you might be thinking to yourself, self, this is what I picture in my brain when I think about a camping van from when I was a kid or whatever. Uh, But um, Volkswagens are not necessarily the best investment (laughs) for most camping van people. Uh, Do you find that to be true? Uh, Yes. I think um, if you're going to buy a Volkswagen, I would recommend being mechanical Mm-hmm. because things go wrong because they're older and finicky and if you aren't mechanical it's you're just going to spend a lot of time having other people fix the things that go wrong so you want to have kind of have be able to fix some things yourself um one of what linda who also works with me um her and her husband drove a van again to the bottom of south america so mm. they are awesome but her husband you know he he knows how to fix things and is really yeah. familiar with the engine and how it all works. So, um, yeah, I think that if you're mechanical, they can be a good option, but just kind of be ready to need to troubleshoot things. The parts yeah. aren't necessarily ready, readily available. And yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're also ex- expensive, you know, mm-hmm. um, for how, uh, I guess for being an older van, they're a lot more expensive than other vans from the same time frame. Right, right. Yeah, it's you know you're you're paying for having a Volkswagen. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's a, it's um, it's like having a Range Rover. You know, that's an older Range Rover. It's not about the vehicle, though. I'm going to get emails now from Range Rover lovers. Uh, it's more about <laughs> it's more about the the hobby and that yeah. this is the thing you identify with and love. And that's OK. Like if that's your yeah. you, awesome. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, Volkswagen yeah. definitely has like a cult following. Like, yeah. But if you're are... just getting involved, you know, and you don't have like an allegiance, maybe move to something that's a little bit more affordable and not going to break as often, especially if you're me and not mechanical at all. Yeah. <laughs> at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, can you give us three or four tips for people who want to get started with having and using a camper van, but maybe don't know what to do? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think the first thing that's really, really important is just getting as educated as you can about what you want. Um, on my website, we have more than 50 blog posts that kind of go through each step of the process from choosing the vehicle, um, DIY versus hiring a professional conversion company. Hmm. Um, you know, do you need a bathroom? Like what kind of bed do you want? Um, so there's just so many decisions to make. And I think the more you read up, the more YouTube videos you watch, um, just the more familiar you get with your own needs and priorities, the more likely you're going to end up with the right van. Um, I'm actually on my second van. So the first van that I got, I was wooed by some pretty photos on the internet um, of a particular conversion company. I didn't really do a ton of research into what I wanted. I ended up with a convertible bed and a full indoor bathroom with a shower and 30,000 miles into that van, it was really clear that that layout and 
the things that I thought were my priorities were not actually my priorities. Um, so I sold that and got the van that I have now, which doesn't have a shower. It has a platform bed that we don't have to, you know, make and put away every day. And um, a, a more dedicated place for me to work since I work full time when I'm um, mm. on the road. Um, so just getting really familiar with what you actually want and need, I think is just so important. Um, I also recommend if you do buy a van new um, or even a used, but like a cargo van that hasn't been converted yet, I think it's a really good idea to just put an air mattress in there and a cooler, take a few trips um, with your gear. They don't have to be long, but just sort of using the van and sleeping in it and kind of seeing, you know, what you think that you need once you're out there using it before you actually build it out. And then you can kind of tape, tape out the floor. So like, okay, this is where the bed's going to go kind of like you would if you were building a house to kind of just really draw it out, but it just helps to use the van if you can, before it's actually mm. converted to kind of get a sense of how you're using the space and, you know, uh, just being out there, I think is, is helpful. <clears throat> um, I think going to, there's so many different van events now. Um, we put on our own event. It's called Open Roads Fest. Um, we haven't been able to do it the last two years because of COVID, but we're bringing it back uh, next year. It'll be in July. Hopefully we're just waiting to confirm the dates, but um, you can find that website. It's openroadsfest.com to kind of see what it was like in the past. But we have workshops cool. and lots of outdoor activities and vendors and van tours. And it's just like a really fun way to get involved with the community and see a lot of van builds and conversions before you do your own. Um, at our event in 2019, we had about, I want to say about 80 tent campers who came to learn and mingle with the community before investing in their own van. So I think doing something like that is super helpful. And, you know, we have our event, but there's tons of other events. Ours is in Idaho, um, but they're all over the country. So I would definitely recommend going to some of those if you have an option to do so. Hmm. Um, yeah. And those, those are probably my three biggest tips for like doing research before you take the plunge. Cool. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing that. And I think a van party, it's my, what I'm going to call it, would be fantastic. It yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. Um, okay. So uh, for our last but not least, if you would talk to us a little bit about your favorite and maybe most essential uh, outdoor gear. Might be the same thing, might not, but you know, something that you love, can't live without or whatever. Well, I think my the van itself was probably my favorite. I don't know if that qualifies. I think as a piece I of think gear. it does. Makes, <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, as far as gear inside the van or that we use a lot, um, would say like my camp chairs. We have the Iana or um, the Helinox, sorry, um, mm -hmm. chairs which are super comfortable and lightweight, and they pack down small. So we use those every day in our van. Um, I think having like a good quality jacket, I mean, you have really have to kind of pare down your clothing to the essentials and things yeah. that are really functional and that you can wear in different occasions. So, um, I have an Arc'teryx, I think it's called the Adam LT jacket. It's like my favorite jacket. I can wear it hiking. I can wear it around the campfire. Um, so that's something that I use every day in the van and uh yeah it's just been a really functional item of clothing um but yeah i have a ton of gear lists on my website as well for like i have a clothing yeah, yeah, pack yeah. packing list and yeah all my favorite stuff but those are probably two of the things that i use the most yeah and uh of course people can find your website at barefoot theory but it's not barefoot it's barefoot like a bear like, like the, the kind animal. Of, yes. Like, <laughs> like the kind of foot you don't want to see when you're out in a van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually na named my blog. I have a Grateful Dead dancing bear tattooed on my foot. So that's where it right. comes from. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. All right. 
very last thing. Um, if we're going to walk out of this, imagining ourselves with you in your most favorite outdoor moment, where are we and what are we doing? Ooh. Oh, boy. It's so hard because there's just so many beautiful places to explore. And I think the pandemic certainly has helped me, you know, I've, I've, when the pandemic started, it was like, oh, I'm so, I haven't traveled abroad in quite a long time, actually, because I've had Mm. the van and it makes it so easy to travel domestically. And I think it's easy to see all the pictures online and on Instagram of people jet setting all over the world and feel that like itch to, oh, I got to get abroad. But the van has made me realize just how many amazing and beautiful places there are in this country. Um, but I would say that a couple of my favorite places to be in the van, um, I really like Colorado. There's just so much public land there. And we spent uh, about six weeks in Southwest Colorado this fall. And that was amazing. Just beautiful mm-hmm. mountains, beautiful colors. And um, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite places. And then of course I grew up in Idaho. So I think there's some really special places in Idaho that I really enjoy uh, doing van life at as well. Awesome. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us on Humans Outside today. I really appreciate this deep dive into uh, how to do van life. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to reach out on Instagram or on my website. Um, We do our best to you know, respond to everybody and, you know, we're here to help and be a resource for people. So. Awesome. And we'll have uh, links to all of those things in the show notes for everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Humans Outside. If you've enjoyed this episode, give us a little love and leave a rating and review to make it easier for others to find the podcast too. What you say matters. It really, truly does make a difference. And until next time, we'll see you out there.